Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here. We're thrilled and excited to be here and to be hosting you. Uh, first, let's just thank our hosts. Fred Wilson is uh, having us over to Union Square Ventures and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Fred. We really want to just thank Fred and Evan Korth who have been so supportive of this event to happen on a regular basis as it's been happening. We really want to thank Ruth Farmer for flying all the way out from Denver to speak with us tonight and bring up all of those uh, portfolios and pamphlets for us. So tonight is all about how do we get more young women involved in computer science. We have two people who are really involved in that work and invested in it who are going to speak with us and give us strategies, real on the ground, what can we do, actionable steps that we can leave the room with today to go back to our schools and our organizations and to really increase our recruitment, uh, our recruitment strategies. Then we have a whole bunch of young women who are actually in it. They're in their first or second year, they've gone through a Girls Who Code program, they go to the Academy for Software Engineering. For some reason, a few of the young women who came here today knew that they wanted to do this or they had somebody to encourage them in the right way. And we want to hear about their experience and see what we can learn from it. We have a couple people that want to let us know about some things that are happening, some of the things that are going on around town. So I'm going to call them up right now. Um, Chris, could you come on up? For, and then, and Devin, could you come on up too? There you are. Do you want to speak first? Go ahead. Okay, so um, hi, I'm Chris Dolan, and um, you know, thank you for inviting me to come and speak. I, um, I was asked to organize a um, programming competition that would, in, would be not a hackathon because women don't participate in hackathons, um, but a coding contest that women would want to participate in because we wanted to open it up to a more diverse group. And so we decided to come up with something called Dream It, Code It, Win It. And um, we started off with college students. And uh, we have a prize for women because we'd really like to encourage women to participate. First prize is 20,000, uh, second prize is 15, and third is 10K. And then we have tech service providing a women's prize for 5K. So then, of course, we went to meet with Leanne, and she uh, got us so excited about you know, involving the high school teams that we went back to Trading Screen. Patrick over here is at Trading Screen as well. And um, we convinced our CEO, which wasn't too difficult, we enthusiastically decided to underwrite the high school competition, which we haven't announced yet. Uh, but I, I put these flyers out on the back table to make sure that uh, everybody has an opportunity to take this back with them because we'd really like to get your teams to participate. And it's fairly easy. The judging is based upon the story, the problem you solve, and how effectively you solve it with the solution you create. So it could be just a website, um, but it's more about the story you tell. Yes? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, so just some details. We've already launched the submission page, and we have to uh, uh, make some changes so that it'll accommodate the high school submissions, and it's on facebook.com uh, forward slash dream it, code it, win it. And um, what you have to do is create a video that describes the problem you're solving, the uh, solution to it, and how you've gone about it, and then a quick demo. It can be one or two minutes. And upload it. Uh, for the high schools, they'll have to obviously work with a uh, person that's 18 years or older. And um, the submission page will come down on March 30th. And then on April 30th, we're going to have an awards event. And uh, we have some interesting people. We have Joey Eno from the Media Lab, uh, Mike Perlis, CEO of Forbes. Um, Alec Diaz, who's VP of Product at um, Yahoo. We have Eric Nordlander, who is the Partner of Engineering at Google Ventures. Um, Gene Sullivan, who is a uh, Founder and GP of Starvest Partners. And Philippe Buhannik, who's the Co-Founder and CEO of Trading Screen. So it'll be fun. It'll be a, an event after work. It will be providing, um, we'll have a little reception so people can meet interesting you know, uh, people in, in the space, engineers, um, potential uh, internships, uh, jobs, and maybe uh, VCs to invest in cool ideas. So I think it's a great opportunity for the students, and uh, the sheets are on the, on the back table. And Eric, thank you so much for letting us talk about it. Thank you very much. Uh, hey, 
everybody, I'm Devin. As you guys might be able to tell from my shirt, I'm from Technovation. I see a few familiar faces in the crowd. Um, Technovation is a program that seeks to get girls excited about coding and entrepreneurship. Um, we're open to middle school through university age girls. It's a totally female program, but if you're a teacher, you can also be a male if you're excited to implement it. It's a 50 hour curriculum, it's 12 weeks. It actually just started today, but if you're interested, you can still register. Um, we use MIT App Inventor, which is like a really visual-based platform to help girls begin to access coding and programming. And we um, pair all the teams with mentors from the city to help like, with feedback, help you guys as teachers implement the programs, um, help the girls get excited and uh, learn about how to create business plans and how to create uh, and code different mobile applications. So if you're interested, if that sounds like something you want to learn more about, please feel free to check out our website. It's technovationchallenge.org, or you can just come find me and I can talk to you about it. Thanks. Let's find out who is here. Can we just get a couple shout outs? If you are in the classroom, if you are a teacher in some classroom, can we hear from you right now? Who is actually there? I'm going to talk myself. Computer programmers who are in the field, your job is writing software, but you're trying to help out. Can we hear from you guys? In the nonprofit sector, people who are working on the nonprofit side of this whole problem, trying to get girls involved. Who did I miss? Who are the, who are the young women who are actual students that came here today to tell us about yourselves? Can we hear from you guys? <laughs> Who else? Who else? I think we Social stars. entrepreneurs. Social entrepreneurs. <laughs> people who are, who are tech entrepreneurs. People who are in the business world and want to get more women into that world. Can we hear from you guys? <laughs> I am working at the Academy for Software Engineering. My job is to teach computer science there. So I'm sort of positioned to learn a lot about this world. We have a, an enrollment, a female enrollment of 25%. And that's because when you're in eighth grade, young women have to put you on their application for high school. And we don't discriminate against gender, right? So we end up with 25% of our students being young women. We need to change that. So we have a lot of work to do on our end. But there's also so much work that we need to do in the classroom and when we're trying to message even our own classes, even at the Academy for Software Engineering. Recently we had a young woman, a young woman who was really needed to be in, in advanced placement computer science. She was, she was really excelling in her freshman level class. And I said to her, I think you should be in this course. Talk to your parents, come back after the weekend and let me know if you want to do it. And I never heard from her again. A couple of days went by and I was like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm reaching out to you. I, you should, I need you to, why didn't you? And I thought, she doesn't want to do it. Luckily, I had Sean Stern and Leanne Delizer who have been in this for a lot longer and who worked with Girls Who Code. And they said, no, you don't, you don't open the door that way. You don't, it's, not, it's not an opt-in situation. We are bringing you in, and we're going to put you in there, and if you don't want to do it, then you can fill out some form on the other side. We're going to make sure that you're in it, because we know that you can do it, and there's not even a question that you can. So I needed to learn the subtle message that had to shift. I had to learn that there was something else that had to be done. I had to learn that young women are facing a headwind and need to be explicitly included into this, because they've been tacitly excluded for years and years by the culture of a male dominated, boy dominated, we're gonna learn it on our own and then the only pedagogy you're gonna find is in college. So if you don't know it already by the time you get to college, it's not meant for you. Uh, so we need to learn those messages. So that's why we brought in some experts who can tell us about the specific techniques and to teach us about what's really going on in that world. And I know to a large extent we're preaching to the choir, but I thought I was the choir too. And I have a lot to learn. So let me introduce a couple of people who are going to help us with this. I've got like short bios for each of them to read. <laughs> so I'm one of these pieces of paper. So the piece, the piece of paper that I lost. Not the blank one. So Ashley Gavin, who's a curriculum writer. Who goes to code. 
She did her undergraduate work at Bryn Mawr College, teaching middle schoolers computer science. And after spending her first two years out of college at MIT Lincoln Laboratory as a software engineer, she knew she needed to return to teaching. Since then, Ashley's worked on CS Ed projects for the Dalton School, Girls Who Code, the Baldwin School, and Bryn Mawr College. I'm going to read the bio for our other speaker, and I'm going to ask them both to come up. So after Ashley, we're going to have Ruth Farmer, who came all the way out from Colorado to speak with us. Since 2001, Ruth Farmer has focused her efforts on increasing girls' participation in technology and engineering. Currently, she provides strategic planning and direction, fund development, and cultivation of new partnerships at the National Center for Women in Information Technology. Notably, Ruth is the driving force behind the highly successful NCWIT Aspirations in Computing Talent Development Initiative for Young Women. The program has recognized more than 3,000 aspiring technical young women since 2007 and recently added a middle school outreach program. This program also has awarded almost a quarter of a million dollar in professional development stipends for educators. So we're so happy to have both of these speakers with us. And then after those guys speak, we're going to have uh, all of our young women come up and we'll, make, we'll form a, a panel so that we can then ask them lots of questions and hear more about their experience. And then they'll introduce themselves to you. So I'll first ask Ashley to come on up and tell us a little about the world. Hey everyone, I'm just curious, how many of you guys were here last time when I spoke? Okay, not that's good because there are some of the same points relevant in this one, so I don't want to be too redundant. Um, and I'm also setting a timer for myself so that I don't go over time. Um, so what I do at Bryn Mawr, or what I do at Girls Who Code, uh, is I write the curriculum. I I look for teachers and recruit. Yeah, yes, good. Let's go. On. I recruit teachers and I train them, and I help. Oh, yes. Oh boy. <laughs> All right, is this good? Yes. Okay. Um, and I sort of helped them throughout the summer, and Sean Stern uh, was one of our fantastic teachers, and Leanne, where's Leanne, uh, was the original curriculum person on the project and, and paved so much of the road for me, so thank you, Leanne. Um, and I, I'm also a girl who codes. I wasn't in the girl who codes, girls who code program, but I was a young woman that almost was lost to the computer science industry. And I'll just tell you about that. I flunked biology in the ninth grade and argued my way out of summer school. And I was a consistent D and C student in math and science. And I was told repeatedly that I could not take computer science because I was not qualified to take it, even though at home I was building websites and playing video games and using Photoshop and doing sort of these small hints that indicate that someone might be interested in computer science. And then finally, they let me take it instead of math because I had already proven that I was a train wreck at math. So they were like, fine, take computer science. Let's see how you do. And then all of my grades skyrocketed because I was so happy. I was just happy and, and learning and, and more effective. Um, so that's sort of my story. And I almost didn't know about computer science. Um, so I, I like to talk about computer science in the context of a liberal arts education because I think if we approach computer science in the way that we approach English, the way that we pre approach biology, um, I don't know, that just inspired me to do that. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> um, we, we're going to affect a lot more young women. So the other alternative to the title of this talk is why are we so bad at teaching computer science? And the strategies that I'm going to talk a little bit about involve mostly culture, because I think culture is one of the biggest problems here, and then how we like sort of change culture in the classroom, um, and more direct solutions. So you, I'm going to kind of breeze through these, because you guys know sort of the landscape right now with computer science. Uh, people get rich with computer science. They're happy. Uh, it has cachet. People think I'm so much smarter than I am because I'm in computer science. I mean, they really think I'm a genius. I'm not. Um, and there's no other class where you can build a video game. And this has actual tangible learnings that are associated with it. Um, but despite this, no one takes it. And in case you, know, you all know more, more than most people that there aren't enough CS majors to fill demand, going to be four times as jobs, you know, all the whole, the whole spiel. 
um, and so few girls <laughs> take the AP. This number is sort of hard to imagine what that really means, but I'll tell you, there are about 25,000 kids taking the CSAP this year, and only about 5,000 of them were girls. There's something on the order of like 300,000 kids taking the calculus AP. So that just puts it in perspective. Um, and you know, diversity is a problem. There are just so many problems. So I'm going to play this ad because I think that it uh, sort of encompasses if you're able to hear it. I'm Philippe Kahn, and I created the camera phone. Yeah. I'm Ray Kurzweil. I gave your words a voice. I created the ability to share video. We turned your smartphone into a musical genius. And I turned it into a bank. I created Instagram. I created the first text message. We created words with friends. And we created a yep. better way to buy a smartphone. Anyone Any notice phone, anything with this any Best Buy ad? Are kind of the obvious, of right? Of there are no women. There's one dude who's not white. And more than that, the lighting is what really gets me. It's like dark and mysterious, and the, the music is techy and scary. And so they're talking about words with friends, which is something, frankly, my students here in this room could create as if it's like the hardest thing in the entire world. And it makes you feel like unless you have to join this club, and if you're not in this club, you can't uh, learn this stuff. So even telling a student, you're going to build words with friends in this class isn't enough, right? Like that's attractive, and that'll get some of the girls. But then the rest of the girls are thinking from cultural exposure that that's really hard to do. I don't know who thinks why they think it's hard to do, but they do. Um, and oh, that's not doing what I want it to do. Oh, no. Um, I'll breeze through these as well, because I'm sort of running out of These are things that you, if you Google computer science, these are things that you find in the first page of results. So if a girl goes home and she's like, oh, so you told her to look up what computer science is, not helping. They're just, just going to find uh, that stuff. And so it sort of reinforces that these kids who do take computer science are good at it. They're white or Asian, antisocial, geniuses, mathletes, nerdy. And therefore, computer science is boring. It's a form of math. It's isolating. It's uncreative and difficult. Um, and we're reinforcing those stereotypes as educators when we teach these kinds of things and call it computer science, you know, like how to Google something. Um, and the schools that do uh, offer computer science are only allowing the top tier kids in. So you, you know all that. And this is a horrifying thing to show your students on the first day of class. Please don't do it. Um, so what I'm trying to get at is, um, that computer science is not about reinforcing that culture of like with the Java and like uh, the, the more the language driven concepts. We want to do it in more liberal arts approach. So just as history is not ab about citing primary sources, English is not gra grammar, computer science is not about programming. Computer science is not about programming. And if we pro take this approach in our classes, our girls are going to fare much better. If we're doing kinesthetic activities in our first day of class, get the girls active and playing games and not even typing, they're going to do a lot better. If we sort of dip our toe in that more technical, scare, I don't even know what to call it, that scary side, they're going to do a lot better. Um, I've, when I'm talking to girls, I like to talk about computer science as self-expression and translation. The number one thing that I like to say to girls is, have you ever had an idea for an app that you want? Have you ever seen an app and you're like, oh, I thought of that? And they're like, yeah, I did. And then, or maybe they won't even think of anything. And you'll say, the reason you didn't act on it is because you don't know computer science. There are all these people out there who have this ability to express themselves in a computing term, in computing terms, and that make it actionable, that they can make it actionable. Um, oh, I told you my whole history. Um, so it's time to start giving assi assignments that are actionable and broader. So it's time to stop giving assignments that are like a palindrome is a word. I'm probably really low on time. I'm sorry, you guys. I'm all over the place. Uh, time to give a st stop giving assignments like a palindrome is a word or a phrase or sentence that is spelled the same way backwards as forwards. How many of you guys have ever gotten that assignment? I'm curious. A bunch of people. Yeah, boring. And start giving assignments like this. Build a slot machine, research what you think a slot machine is, and then actually make it. Um, it's sort of like telling kids in an English class to explain, this, explain the significance of the Great Gatsby or the American Dream and the Great Gatsby, and then handing them the book and highlighting all of the sections for them 
with the, great, with the American dream signified in it. An English teacher would kill you if we gave an assignment like this to the students, taking all the thinking out of it. So um, I find that assignments like this, where you keep it open-ended, lets girls be creative. I can't tell you how many slot machines I saw with Justin Bieber, Miley Cyrus, <laughs> and One Direction characters like for the slots. So many. If you keep it, people are like, oh, bring pop culture in. You don't have to. Keep it open, and they will bring it themselves. If you tell them to make a robot do a dance, they will do the Harlem Shake. <laughs> It'll just happen. It has happened in my classrooms. You don't have to tell them. They'll just do it. And by keeping it open-ended and, and letting the learnings come out of that discovery, you're going to get girls a lot more engaged than by giving them a spec and letting them build it. The spec is for the boys who like, already love doing that stuff. Um, so I've sort of already talked about this. I want to get to more interesting things. So in 2013, uh, we taught 160 high school girls computer science. Look how normal they are. A rainbow of diversity. We're not taking like the geekiest girls and teaching them CS. We're taking normal girls. Some of them are in this room. Um, and they, we have no idea whether or not they'll be good at computer science by normal standards. Um, and most of them had never taken CS, and many of them weren't allowed to, just like me. And by giving them these open-ended uh, topics that they could explore and put their own twist on, we succeeded. 99% of students desired to make a career in technology, 95 won a major, 87 could pass out of CS 101. And here's a direct comparison between the AP CS curriculum. Our girls are doing twice as well in the A category and like a third, two thirds less in the failing category. Um, so, oh my God, my time. This is a 25 minute talk, you guys. I'm trying to cram into 10 minutes. Oh, I'm already over. I'll wrap it up. Um, no, can I go like two minutes over? Yes. Okay, cool. So these are sort of the four steps that I see as being critical to getting girls in the classroom and get, keeping them engaged. Uh, Project-based learning, shareable technologies, context, and ignoring job descriptions. Let them, as much as you possibly can, let them come up with their own ideas. Give them ownership over what they're building. That applies to all people, not just girls, right? We like to do things that we care about. Um, so even if you have a specific thing like a slot machine, let them add like extra slots so they can have as many pictures of Justin Bieber as they want. Let them do that. Um, so they have to go through the idea, make the spec themselves, and then they get the great uh, bonus of going through a design process. Girls love to design things. It's not a secret. Let them design things, because it is rel relevant to the, to, the, um, to the project. They'll have to code this up anyway, so let them do it. And then they can share it. Um, so CS is unique in that it's, uh, can, students can build sh usable technologies. Girls love social networks. Um, Diana, who's one of my students, built a video game for her final project, and it went viral so much to the point that girls were coming the next year to our recruitment uh, event, and they saw Diana's game and they went, oh, I've played that. They love to share stuff, so let them share it. If kids have to download NetBeans to play the, kid, the girl's game, something has gone wrong. Stop. <laughs> you back up. Um, so let them share. Let them put it on YouTube. Tell them to put it on Facebook. Have a contest for who can get the most views on their game. Um, and then also kids don't believe that they're coding. So make these things uh, relevant to real life, uh, real life assignments. So the slot machine, they don't use slot machines, but they do play Candy Crush Saga, which is exactly the same thing. Looking at three fruits in a row or three candies in a row, same thing. When you, when you do the Roomba, when kids know what a Roomba is, so if you do a maze solving algorithm, boom, same thing, same algorithm. Um, and stop teaching technologies that are relevant to industry now because they're just not going to be later. Who cares what language they know? When I interviewed at these places, they didn't care what language I knew. They cared how I thought. So stop getting into arguments about what language you're going to use. Use the language that's best for the task. Um, so for me, any class that I do, and I, I update my classes every year because the technologies are changing. If you learned to code today, what would you build? And that's sort of the question that I ask my students. And in terms of recruiting girls, you're not going to do it based on necessarily just the projects. I strongly suggest a field trip if you can. Any kid, even if you know, they are not interested in technology, everyone wants to visit Google's office. 
Everybody. Everyone. <laughs> so go to Google. Go to you know, Facebook if you can. If you can manage a field trip, girls who care about making money, when they see the work environment, they'll come in and try your class, and then you'll get them hooked with the projects. So that's my way over time talk. I thank you for listening. Ruth is going to give us another 10 to 15 minutes. Please feel, don't feel too much pressure. Um, okay. And then we'll introduce our girls. Um, first off, do we have CSTA members in the room? Yes? Okay. Um, I don't know if you saw this, but they announced today that they're going to be giving an award for ad administrators that are supportive of computer science in the high schools and moving that forward. So one strategy that I found is amazing at getting things moving is to shower someone with praise for something they're doing a little bit right and then other people will follow suit so look for that award from CSTA and you can nominate your school administrators for that and that can get you some accolades hopefully so I am not on my slides okay sorry about that that's okay where is the cursor it's on the other it's on the yeah oh oh there we go Sorry, I'm using uh, old school technology here. Okay, so this is me. I love this picture. That was actually the picture they were like, hold up your name tag so we know who you are. And it turned out better than all the other pictures. Um, <laughs> and I have been doing technology and engineering and girls since 2001 when I was working at the Girl Scouts and they got a big grant from Intel. And my boss was like, well, we'll hire someone to do this. I was like, forget that. I'll automate all my other stuff and I'll do this. And um, that's kind of how I fell into that niche. And it very nicely fits in with my gender equity, women's rights beliefs, and um, found that women in STEM was a place where things just weren't moving as fast as they could. So that's what I've been doing for a long time. Um, I used to work at the Girl Scouts of the USA and um, was in charge of technology and engineering education for them. So I've done a lot of big projects with big companies. and. Um, now I'm at the National Center for Women in IT, and you probably all know why women matter, but we have lots of materials on our website that you can download to support these arguments, but um, companies make more money when they have diverse teams, their innovation is better, patents that have one woman on the team are cited 42 times more frequently than patents from a single sex team. That's huge evidence for diversity and innovation. So um, it really matters. It matters to me because it's fair. It's fair. I want girls to have access to the top paying jobs, the innovation jobs, and be part of the design process, be part of creating the world that we live in. I also don't really want to live in a world that's designed by one part of the population. And the example I always use for this, which I love, is how many of you carry a purse? <laughs> Where do you put your purse when you drive with a passenger? Backseat, on the floor. Why is there no place in a, in a car for a woman's purse when half the population carries a purse? 60% <laughs> of automotive purchases are made or influenced by women, yet no one has solved this really simple user need. There's a place for your sunglasses, your iPod, your drinks. I can do all kinds of things in my luxury Saab, all kinds of things with the console, but nowhere to put my purse. If you extrapolate that to how we interact with hardware and software every day, it's no wonder that girls aren't running towards computer science if the entire system is being designed by and for the male mind. So I want that to change. So um, one of the things NCWIT does is we give you data, lots and lots of data. And um, I brought the girls in IT the facts report. I also brought the scorecard. These are actually just teasers for about a 90-page report each. Everything that we have is available to you for free and you can download all the graphs and all the charts and all the different one-pagers and things and put them into your own slideshows and use them to argue with your administrators or whoever you need to argue with. We also have a, um, by the numbers, and I'm sorry we don't have, I meant to bring this, there's a pocket version of this that I keep in my purse because when you're on an airplane or something and somebody's like, well, what about women in technology? There's plenty. I saw one yesterday. <laughs> and my wife, uh, you know, there's some other argument. And so then you can just pull that out and be like, actually, here's the real statistics. Um, so we have a lot of that information. But one of the things that um, really strikes me is that, that big math myth, girls aren't into math. 
actually 46% of AP calculus tests are taken and passed by girls. So there's not a shortage of smart girls that can do math. There's a shortage of smart girls that can do math that go into technology. And so making that transition is really important, and that's what we're trying to work on. So I'm with the National Center for Women IT. We're a big resource for you guys. We're funded by the National Science Foundation. CSTA is a member. Um, we have a startup alliance. We have lots of lots of groups working together on this issue. And we make resources. So these are just, we have 139 resources. So I only brought a few. But you will see in the back top 10 ways to recruit young women into your classes. I don't intend to take any of these home with me. So take as many as you like. And these are, everything we do is research based. We didn't just pull this out of the air. We have a team of social scientists who I refer to as the ring wraiths that um, <laughs> control what can go out of our organization as vetted research. So everything we, we put out is based on research on education practices. We also just released top 10 ways to make um, computing competitions more inclusive of girls. And so as you're building hackathons and, and competitions and other ways that, you know, everybody's hot on competitions. The president is like, we need to have these STEM competitions. They aren't taking into account that a lot of the ways that those things are designed actually tells girls and minorities not to participate. So that is in this piece. So um, we have a number of resources, and we also have curricula. Has any of you guys ever used CS Unplugged? Okay, CS Unplugged is fantastic for outreach. So say you're gonna go to a feeder middle school and try to recruit girls to come to your high school or you're just gonna do a fair at your own high school. CS Unplugged has all these wonderful activities that are physical, move around, magic tricks, games. There's a sorting network you can put on the ground in chalk or tape and you can number the kids and then they follow the rules and they sort themselves. We've done that at the USA Science and Engineering Festival. I've done it at the SWE events. It's a great, like, big open event. You can do it on your playground. You could try to break the world record, have 100 kids do it at the same time. That's the record right now. So um, CS Unplugged is great. We also have a new curriculum coming out shortly from MIT um, in partnership with the Media Lab. We're doing a e-textiles in a box. I know. <laughs> I know. So we've been, we've been beta testing it with um, some middle school um, art teachers in Colorado and some Girl Scout troops. And it uses Arduino chips and conductive thread to make interactive um, crafts and stuffed animals. And you can make a little owl that's eyes will blink with your heart rate and stuff like that. It's really cool. And that's sort of our sort of maker craft avenue of getting more girls to start playing with technology. So that's going to be available soon. And I'm working on a potential maker contest with some new technology that Intel is putting out shortly. The other thing that I want you to download is, you see that one in the middle, how can I prepare for a computing major? We have, how can I prepare for a computing major? Which computing majors are right for me? Which computing pathway is right for me? We have a number of resources that you can hand to your students. We also have resources in Spanish um, that you can hand to the parents of your students that talk about these careers and what they are and what you might do. So which computing um, career is right for me is like, okay, I'm into art and graphics. Maybe I want to be a graphic user interface designer. You know, it has those types of answers for kids that make things kind of tangible. So um, the big thing that we do two big things that in your space. One is counselors for computing. And um, I've already talked to Eric about this. And if there's interest, I can get our trainer out here to train counselors from all your schools. But we have a whole set of materials and trainings and handouts and posters for counselors about computing careers. Because oftentimes, the counselors are just telling all kids, well, those jobs are gone, or they just aren't, don't have the right information. And then we have aspirations in computing. How many of you have had an aspirations in computing award winner among your students? <laughs> your daughter? OK, there we go. Yay. So what? Yes, they're all equal. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, because that is our way of encouraging. Boy, that's some pixelation. OK, so we have, as you can see, under aspirations in computing, there is now three things, Aspire IT, the Educator Award, and the award for aspirations in computing. 
And so Aspire IT is our new middle school program. I launched this last summer. I gave out $100,000 of grants and that yielded 800 girls in 24 sites doing computing. And um, that cost $125 a girl because I shared all those costs with universities and K-12 organizations. And the way that works is we pay aspirations and computing winners. We give them grants of up to three to $5,000 to do outreach to little girls. And I believe that <coughs> high school girls are uniquely qualified at inviting little girls into technology. And I plan to scale that program out um, very quickly over the next few years. And that's our middle school entry point. And that's uh, Hannah, who is um, one of our national award winners this year. And she founded uh, Robot Springboard, which goes to Homer, Alaska, and teaches robotics to kids in Alaska. And she has a twin sister. Yeah. Yeah, who's like a foot taller she than went her. To Baldwin. Yeah. We should connect. That's yeah. so funny. So we have an educator award. So, like um, Eric had said, we give awards to teachers like yourselves. I think um, we. We're not yet. Somebody here was one once. No, it was Kristen. It was, it was Kristen. Okay, so every location we select a teacher and we give that teacher $1,000 for professional development and we also give them um, this year a laptop from Dell. So 60 teachers this year will get $1,000 and a laptop and um, publicity and other things. And then we kind of pull you into a network and Apple will say, you know, send me 10 teachers for Coco Camp or Microsoft will ask for people and so we kind of it's a vetting process. So that is on the radar. The way you get that award is by encouraging girls in your classes to apply for the Aspirations in Computing program. And there's one of our teachers down in Georgia. And then the award for Aspirations in Computing. Um, this is really the crux of it. And I have to ref reflect what she was saying about girls doing um, their own self-directed stuff. The real secret, I really, really believe the real secret is encouragement. And as Eric said, it's not more encouragement than a boy needs. It's making up for the headwind. So if they are being told every day of their lives by the media, by their parents, by their peers, messages they're getting all throughout their life that this is not for them, they need a little bit more of a push than a boy does. And you need to keep pushing them. One of the things that startles me so much is we run the numbers on um, the engineering majors at CU Boulder where I work. Boys drop out of, this, of the engineering major with a 1.9 GPA. They should drop out. They're failing. That's a D. Girls leave the major with a 3.2. Girls who are not failing, girls who are doing well, leave the major. Girls who are above the national average by quite a bit. The national average is 2.7. So there's a problem of self-perception of success. And that's why encouragement is necessary. And that why is why encouragement needs to continue to happen over and over and over again. So our strategy for operationalizing and making this happen at a national scale for thousands of girls, girls who don't have teachers like you, girls who are in the middle of nowhere. Like one of our award winners my first year was from Ulm, Montana. And on her application, she said, there's no technology at my high school. There's nothing for me to take. There's no college nearby. I made myself CTO of the school paper. I put the paper online. I'm training the new CTO before I graduate. Of course we want her. Of course we want to encourage her and pull her into the pipeline. So we use this award process as really it's a hook to identify girls that are interested, have potential, and could move forward with more support and encouragement. And we pull them into a national community of peers, and we support them until they graduate college. And that includes sponsorship. And I, there's a big difference between mentorship and sponsorship. Sponsorship means if one of my girls applies to Apple, Apple gets a phone call that says she's one of ours. If our girls are going to an event, we connect them all together. We make sure that they have a host and they know how to find each other. So we're giving them the same kind of sponsorship that men have gotten for decades through sort of like social networks and just the old boys club. And we're doing that for them. And they're doing that for each other because we now have in this large group, a little over 3,500 girls, the girls that are graduates are now working at Google, working at Facebook, and they're pulling in the other girls. Awesome. So 
that's kind of how it works, and I could talk about it all day long. 83% of the girls in this program are still in engineering or computer science. And that's of the girls in college. Obviously, some are still in high school. And we've recognized more than 3,750%, more than 50% are non-white, which is pretty exciting. And the big point is that they're a community. So I call it a push-pull peer pressure. So you are pushed out of the classroom by that headwind, by the media messages, by the all-boy classroom, by the posters on the wall, by the geeky environment and stereotypes. You're pulled out by your peers and girlfriends that are like, what are you doing there when we're over here? Why are you doing that geeky thing? In our surveys of the girls after we give them this award, 78% say, because of this award, I am less embarrassed, afraid, or ashamed of being a girl in technology. They use the word ashamed. And you know, I think we don't, as adults, really comprehend what an uphill battle it is to go, I'm 14 and I'm going to walk into this classroom that is 80% boys. And I'm going to stick it out and I'm going to prove myself every single day over and over and over and over. And I even have young women that are juniors at Carnegie Mellon that, you know, you are cream of the crop. Junior at Carnegie Mellon, interning at Microsoft says to me, I don't know why you gave me this award. I'm not good enough. Everyone else seems to get it and I don't. Why am I even here? And I'm like, Okay, you're swimming in the shallowest pond in the nation, okay? Don't compare yourself to all these people at Carnegie Mellon, number one. You're already better than a lot of people just by virtue of being there. But I'm like, just because someone acts like they get it doesn't mean they actually get it. They might be bolstering their own self-esteem. They might just be bragging. Um, or maybe they have a lot more preparation. Maybe they took that class once, once, failed it, and they're taking it a second time. You don't know. You can't internalize those things. You have to understand that, say you have an exam in your classroom, a boy walking out going, I aced that, his comment is actually affecting the self-perceived confidence of the girl next to him, even if she did better than he did. Because a boy with a B plus would be like, I aced that, and a girl with an A minus is suicidal and like crying. So you have to you know, think about when you recognize students for their, um, for their achievements, that you're praising the hard work that they did versus praising their innate smarts and ability and your natural talent. There's that whole like, um, what's it called? It's um, growth versus fixed mindset. So that's really important. Another thing to um, keep in mind is what we call stereotype threat. Has everybody heard about stereotype threat? So we have a number of resources on our website and lots of research around stereotype threat and oftentimes totally well-meaning adults will create stereotype threat environments for students. So when a young woman walks into your class, you don't immediately say, wow, you must be brilliant because you you're in computer science. I mean, you're a girl in computer science. There's no girls in computer science. If you notice there's no girls in computer science, you must be brilliant. That happens, and then they have this stereotype that they have to live up to. And if they don't perform brilliantly, then they're failing themselves and every other member of their gender. And at the same time, you don't want to call them out and be like, you're so brave. You're just so brave to be here as a woman all by yourself in this environment. You must be just really, really into it and so brave. So some of that messaging, you don't mean to do it. You might be meaning well, but that happens a lot of times, even at the undergraduate level. And then the other thing that I wanted to um, Echo was around the question set. So I was with uh, UT Dallas, and they have this intro to engineering course that all engineering majors are required to take, and they have problem sets that you can choose from. Well, the one computer science related problem that was available in that exam was a first person shooter game. So they're associating computer science with gaming and shooting and not like solving tangible societal problems or addressing issues that are relevant to people. It was just like, oh, here's this problem I pulled out of the archive, I'm gonna drop it onto this exam. Not really realizing the impact that that might have on the perception of different populations and whether or not they wanna be in that field. Um, so back to the community issue. 
having a community for these young women is important because they are going to feel a little bit alone. Um, so like what Girls Who Code is doing is connecting them in the summer. They all become best friends. They connect electronically and virtually all the time. We have girls that have become roommates at college that have never met, but they chose to be roommates. They met through this program. They met online on our Facebook group, and they are now roommates at Virginia Tech. Having a roommate who is also in computer science goes a long way. Having a friend that's there with you, I'm sure you guys know pair programming. You guys do pair programming. That's really important. Um, so keeping that community aspect of it up, because I can tell you, adult women with successful careers in computer science that have been like, yeah, I was just tired of not having anyone to eat lunch with. The, the, the community aspect of it sometimes isn't there. Um, so I think I'm, I'm at 18 minutes, so I'm going to stop. But um, this is our, our plan. And um, all of you can participate. All of your girls can participate. All of the teachers can participate. And we are more than happy to help anybody with um, connections up to um, resources and classroom materials and we can mail you things if you like. Um, we actually engage with these girls between seven and ten years. So once we get a hold of them, we track them and support them until they graduate college or we haven't kicked anyone out yet, so we'll see what happens. And um, we've got a plan to scale this up. And um, these middle school grants are actually available to any girl who receives this award can get this money to do outreach. So that's another resource that we can give to you guys. And um, I think that's good for me. And let's get the girls up here. Please take, please take the resources. That whole table has to be empty before you guys leave. And when, in a few days, I'm not sure Ruth can correct me, the NC, um, NCWIT is going to send out a survey to try to collect some information from you all. So we'll send out something through the meetup group to find out what impact their materials are having. So if you guys could please take them back and put them into whatever context you're coming from, and then we can find out more about how they're being used, and then they can use that information. Well, and we're very interested in knowing what kind of resources you need, because we have a whole team of researchers that create this stuff for us. So if you need something to talk to a certain kind of parent group or a certain kind of girl or something that's going to resonate with a certain community, let us know because we're always putting more things in the pipeline. So if you're a, a student, if you're a young woman who came here tonight, would you please come join us up front? We, we would love to hear from you guys and meet you guys too. I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves. Uh, we would love to just know your name, what um, what school you're coming from, um, and just a little bit about about yourself. And then what we want is the everyone in the audience is just full of questions for for you all and for Ruth and for Ashley. So can we start with Laura and we'll just go down the row. Just tell us your name and, and one or two words about yourself. Um, hi, my name is Laura Wilson. Um, I'm a male of eight children, um, and um, I'm in 11th grade, and I come from St. Pete Rescue School. Hi, I'm Diana Cristofaro. Um, Ashley made mention of me and made the game thing, and I go to Rutgers, New Brunswick. Rutgers! <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, I'm Astro Rosario. I'm a sophomore at the Academy for Software Engineering, and this past summer I was able to intern at Morgan Stanley. I'm Helen. Um, I'm a senior at Staten Island Technical High School. I was in the second class of Girls Who Code, and um, I helped make an app that um, lets people find bathrooms near them. <laughs> I'm Malika. I'm a senior at Brooklyn Technical High School. I'm a member of Girls Who Code, like the second year, and I'm currently working on my second project for so yeah. <laughs> I'm Amanda Chen. I'm a junior um, at the Spence School and I participated in Girls Who Code this past summer and 
I'm working with Malika on an app for high school students to find colleges. Excellent. It's very nice to meet you. I'm, I'm just going to get us started with just some questions, and, and also for, for Ashley and for Ruth, we just want to have a discussion, and often we find the audience just goes back and forth with each other, too. We want to see how much we can learn from each other in the next 25, 30 minutes. Um, but I would love to know, for you guys, what, um, what's the your favorite part about being in computing or being in, involved in technology? What's your favorite part about that? You get to make really cool things that you didn't think that you'd be able to do. That's just really cool. I think it, um, it gives you a lot of opportunity because like, it's, such, it's such a wide field and I think there's a lot of jobs that they're looking for people who know how to work with technology and work with computing. I really like it because you get to meet a lot of really cool people and work with them uh, really one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I got to meet some of the smartest, most amazing people over the summer and uh, continuing my journey in computing, I know I'll get to meet a lot of other really awesome people. Um, I like creating things that I never thought I would be able to and especially especially putting my ideas into like place and I also like meeting other girls who have the same interests as me, and I like proving people wrong. Because when I tell people I like computer science, people are like, oh, that's a guy's thing, but it's not. Yeah, I think the tech community is really awesome, and it's great to be a part of it. And also, I think um, just learning how to code is really empowering because you can really apply it to any field. Um, Ashlyn is, is, one of, is actually my student, and I really want to encourage her to apply for Girls Who Code. Do you guys think that that's a, a good idea? Should she do that? <laughs> <laughs> what was, what's the best thing about Girls Who Code? Um, I think the best thing about Girls Who Code um, is not only meeting new people, but actually going to field trips. Like when we went to Google and other places like Palantir and Twitter, like it was interesting to learn about um, computer science and to see actually women who are in the computer science field. <coughs> you gain this like support group of like girls who become your best friends. And it's like really awesome to know that like when you do something that has anything to do with computer science, like these four girls would be like, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, it's really cool. Uh, well, totally on the support network and the trips, they were really awesome. And anyone who has a chance to apply, totally, uh, totally apply. But um, my favorite part of it was um, getting to work with different groups of people, or different groups of girls on different projects because uh, for each one I got a lot of insight that I wouldn't have had otherwise if I hadn't talked to them about you know, whatever uh, problem we were working on. So uh, just getting to, to kind of pick at everyone's brains uh, throughout the entire summer was my favorite part. Um, my favorite part was meeting the girls who had similar interests as me because like after the program we basically became best friends and we've, we've been to hackathons together, we planned road trips and like, like they're always there to support you and provide you with resources and other things. Um, my favorite part was also definitely the network of girls there were girls all over the country, and you also got connected with mentors that you could turn to for advice. And I guess after the program, um, there's, there's still that long-lasting connection with your peers and also your teachers and the speakers you met, so I really like that uh, community. Just to speak to the community a little bit, there are 180 girls who've now gone through this program, and I had no idea until I was invited to the Facebook that they, group that they had created online and 155 of those girls were in the Facebook group. And in the Facebook group, they were posting, I need help with my homework. And someone would help them with their homework, or there's a hackathon this weekend, anyone want to come? And the girls who've never met in real life, they're going to the hackathon together. They're, they're, they're now their friends on Facebook they've never even met. Um, it's un it was unreal. The current social media technology really presents this unique opportunity to create a virtual peer group to replace the one that doesn't exist in the classroom. And it's not going to exist in their college classrooms for a while. 
And so a really good example of this is um, one of the girls started a program in Chicago called Chicago Girls in Computing. She raised $6,000 on um, Piggybacker and created this club for girls that don't have computer science in their high schools. They meet once a month at a different tech company around the Chicago area. She's like a junior in high school. And that is a really great example of why this community aspect of it is so important. Being connected to other girls that like what you like and validate your interests is really important. So if you guys all individually have one to three to five girls that are in your classes, you could use something like Facebook or some other social networking tool to connect up all the girls in the New York metro area into a group and have them communing in that same way. And sometimes it's helped me with my homework or helped me solve this problem, and sometimes it's one of the, my favorite conversations was this big bitch fest about screen creep and the fact that screens keep getting bigger and girls can't use them with one hand anymore. And they're like, what about us? Why aren't the designers thinking about us? And why is, why is the phone so big now? And there was this whole conversation about you can't fit it in your pocket, you can't type with one hand. And that's a whole technical need that's being missed because they're not there. So I can't stress this community aspect, obviously. they agree with us. Uh, my, my question is, uh, actually I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, at what point in your journey in learning to code did you feel like you became very comfortable with struggle, struggle over a hard problem? And then the second question that I have well, maybe you haven't gotten there yet, I don't know, but I think it happens early on. Um, at least it did for me. But the, the, the second question I have is, how has learning to code enabled you to deepen your interest in other academic subject areas? Do you feel like it's had spillover effects? I'll start with that. Um, to address your first question, um, it was actually um, on the project that I was working on where I had big enough that tells you where the nearest bathroom is. Uh, it was a project uh, that I did uh, with three other girls at Girls Who Code. And uh, we, used, we did it using uh, the Google Maps API. And the first time somebody said, oh yeah, you can use that, I was like, what is the API? What is that even mean? I don't know anything about that. But uh, somehow like we split up all the assignments and I was, I was stuck with figuring out what it is and how to use it, the Google Maps API. And going through that, like Googling what an API is and uh, like asking all my teachers, you know, how, like, what do I do with this? How, like, where does this go? What does this even mean? And then kind of just doing trial and error for hours and hours on end. And then finally having a map pop up on my computer screen through, you know, through the code that I've written. And just that kind of, like, my heart exploded kind of feeling. <laughs> that was, I feel like that was the moment where I was like, yes. I appreciate the struggle because I know the benefits are awesome. Uh, and for your second question, uh, before I uh, before I kind of got into computing, computing uh, I always saw myself going into like, public policy and international relations. I thought I was going like, to be at the UN my entire life um, and like help save the world. But uh, going into uh, and being introduced to computing showed me that I can still do that, but much more tangibly. Because now I and now I know that you know I don't say anymore I'm going to end world hunger. I say you know what what is the problem in this country and then how can you know better communication through you know a certain net, like social network or how can better um, you know, access to information like how to get internet in you know really remote areas like answer questions like that is kind of where I see the spillover in my life. I think the moment... <laughs> um, I think the moment when, like, you do, like, system that, that print something, and, like, like, the first time when you're, like, introduced to coding, and, like, something finally pops up on that little box is, like, when you realize that the struggle is worth it, because something, you're, like, bored with this thing, even though it might be, like, Girl, like it's it's really great because you did it yourself. So I think once you realize how rewarding like the output is, is when the struggle becomes like a great thing. If you realize you're getting somewhere with the struggle. I'm curious about what Ashlyn's gonna say because at the <laughs> we're a high school where you have to take computer science 
it's like a core subject. It's like English or math. Have you ever said that struggle? How great! I love that. Well, um, <laughs> 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 well, what I like, what I really enjoy about it is that it's okay not to get it right the first time because like the backspace button exists. So, <laughs> um, you know, I'd be working at a piece of code for hours trying to figure out like, where did I go wrong? Like, why does it not like me so much? And it feels like just so good to finally get it right. So I would say that's really rewarding when I think you work at anything and you finally get it right after working on it so long. And I think like programming, it's a lot about taking a lot of like little pieces and putting it together. And I would say I use that a lot in like science or math because those aren't like my strongest subjects, but I like to break those problems down, kind of like how I would do with programming. Um, for spillover, I found that um, not, not only math or science, but I feel like learning how to code has also helped me with um, the humanities aspect. For example, like writing essays, I've learned how to kind of think logically, and that's helped me become a better writer. I know how to piece my um, essays together better, and um, I feel like it's also made me more confident as a person. Having the skill makes me more willing to kind of offer my insight in class, and I feel like it's just kind of um, changed the way I think and look at problems and um, kind of improved um, me in the classroom. Another question. So I was talking to a friend of mine who's a lady um, about math, and she said she was not very good at math. Um, and then we dug into it deeper, and she got like a four on the AP Calc exam in high school. Um, so I was like, that's a weird way to not be good at math. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you guys this question. And you know, answer honestly. It's not meant to judge you, but you know, for your age, for what you've done, you guys say that you are good at programming. If yes, why? If no, why? I'm just curious. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I wouldn't say I'm good at programming, but I would say I'm really good at asking questions. So that, like, if I don't get something right, I'm very good at asking, like, okay, what can I use so I can solve this? So I don't really, I wouldn't say I'm good or bad at um, I feel that, I don't usually describe myself as like a good programmer. Uh, even though I spent you know, eight weeks with the Girls Who Put Program, I do a Saturday class now that's actually hosted by Mr. Zmanski. Uh, and I run a Girls Who Code club at my school. And like, I don't, I guess my take on it is that I don't have like a lot of experience, even though that does, like, well, once I say it, it seems like a lot of experience, but like, personally, <laughs> like, experiencing it, knowing that people have literally spent decades doing it, I feel like in comparison, it's not, it's like literally a blip on the screen. So I feel that you know, once I have those decades, maybe then I'll say I'm a good programmer. <laughs> um, I think. I would say I'm a good programmer because a lot of people think programming is just writing code, but it's not. It's like the skills involved, like the logic, the thinking, the organizational skills. And I think that's something that I learned to be better at. So being able to master those skills, I'd say that would make me a good programmer. Yeah, I think I'm a relatively good programmer considering the experience I had. I just learn to code during grocery code. So I think um, for that eight weeks amount of experience, I'd say I'm pretty good. Like, thank you guys. I know that's a weird question to ask. Like, it's hard to. Understand. I have to. I can't be your teacher and not immediately say that you. I know, Ashlyn. I don't know your experience, but I'm sure you are good. And for the rest of you, I've read your programs. You're all good programmers. Thanks. Cindy. <laughs> Uh, I guess my question is, so when you have a room full of people who really want to help you guys get even better at programming, or better at computing, better at thinking, logically or creatively, um, so how can we help um, 
like in school, outside of school. Obviously, there are programs like Coastal Pro that after school programs, you have amazing teachers who care and um, want to spend hours of time you could. What would you like adults or other peers to do to help you get better? I think one of the things for me was meeting more women that were computer engineers and software software, software, <laughs> software, software engineers, and just seeing them like at their jobs and like doing really awesome things is what like made me want to be more like them. So I guess like being more exposed to like women in computer science. We're working on getting more girls at AFC. That's what we're going to get there. I think what would help is if maybe like the type of projects I'm working on was something more like my interest because if I'm working on something and I'm like, oh my gosh, I really hate this, I'm not really <laughs> going to do too well, even though I'm going to try my best. So I think just making more like assignments that are more kind of free, more that I can put my own thinking and creativity in, that's more fun and better to learn. And also chastise the Department of Education because I don't think I can say personally in my school, our first computer science class is this year. It's a senior elective, which I unfortunately can't take. But uh, it's, uh, I don't know, like they're learning Java, but I know a lot of people don't like it. Uh, like that's what I've heard from my friends. And it's, it's also, once again, I, like it's our first computer science class in a technical high school. <laughs> that, that's like, uh, doesn't sound too good to me. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. That actually relates to the question I was going to ask, which is how did you find out about the program, and did somebody have to like grab you and say, hey, there's this program called Girls of Code, why don't you consider it, would you have known about it otherwise, and how much exposure do you think other girls have kind of even known what's out there? Um, I actually heard about it. Um, my sophomore guidance counselor, uh, she told um, my whole class about it, um, and she gave out flies to whoever was interested, and not many people were interested because they were like, what is computer science? And I raised my hand because it seemed interesting. It was only for girls, and I was in an all-girls school, but I was like, yeah, I'm going to take it. So. Um, I found out about Girls Who Code from my older brother, who's a software engineer. Um, he told me about it, but like, it was, I did the first year, so it wasn't really a big thing. And it was like the website was kind of sketchy. And, like, <laughs> <laughs> but then it was like, I had nothing to do with it, so <laughs> I didn't have to finish. It was kind of sketchy. I was like, you're going to go to this place from 9 to 5. And I was like, okay, that sounds cool. Like, I'll apply for it. It was actually very, like, one of the images that they used, like, literally was like from Google Images. Like that. <laughs> and so, like, that's how I heard about it. And then the first day I was like hooked because it was awesome. So actually, my school had a hackathon, and I saw my sister with this really cool shirt, and I was like, "Girl, so cold. Where can I get that?" <laughs> he was like, "Oh, I work here." And then he told me like, I should apply. And he told me more about the site. So, and Ashlyn, I, how did you hear about AFSA? Well, actually, so I got into the second round when I was applying to high schools, and my guidance counselor she gave me this. Uh, <laughs> just this paper that I had AFSC on it. it was this new technology school and I thought that was interesting that I would get to be the first class and kind of shape this school together. I found it about Girls Who Code because uh, my school does this thing where they just send out massive emails with random summer programs that they find and Girls Who Code was on that list. Uh, just clicked on the link. I, it was less sketchy, I assume, than what the first year experience, because uh, it looked my face is actually on that. So. It is. <laughs> 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 uh, <it's sketchy. laughs> it was. Uh, it looked like a really cool program. Actually, like two weeks before I'd seen that, I saw a video where it was people like Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates talking about how important it is to code, and that was just kind of like in the back of my mind when I saw the girls' code application. So I was like, okay, I'll apply. I found out through my database teacher, and he encouraged us to apply, and he encouraged seven of us, but only three of the girls in the major applied, and all three of us got in. So I checked out the site, and they kind of, 
It was interesting because they talked about field trips and all these experiences that you, you'll go through if you do the program, so I decided to apply and I don't regret it. <laughs> Uh, my technology teacher sent out a mass email to all the sophomores and juniors, and I clicked on it. The website looked pretty uh, legit, and <laughs> <laughs> it looked pretty good, so I decided to go. <laughs> um, sorry, to ask a follow-up question. What's the best way to reach you guys? Obviously, you guys said a lot about teachers giving out really Facebook. Yeah. Is, it, is it Facebook? Is it like Snapchat? I don't know. Like, <laughs> yeah. 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 the best way to change yeah. 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 Like Facebook advertisements, or someone has some message? Like message. Yeah. 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 Ms. Williams. If you could describe one sentence what your elevator pitch would be to younger girls for learning computer science, for learning programming, um, what would it be? When one to three sentences. <laughs> this is horrible because I remember during Girls in Code, Ashley literally taught us how to make elevator pitches. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Gates is in there with you, what do you do? And I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> want to do in life, there's uh, there's kind of a, a process that you can follow if you think logically, and whether it's technology related or not, computer science can teach you to think in that logical way. Um, well, I mean, Miss Delizer, I remember the first thing she told me about programming was like, secretly software engineers are very lazy. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and you don't have to be like a super genius to program. You just have to be able to work hard and ask questions. There's no pitch that it's going to be fun. It'll be extremely fun. But that's not what drew you. Thank, thank you. So similar to you guys, I'm very new. Um, eight weeks, you guys have more um, history learning code than I do. But I started a coding program at my school because they, there needs to be one. So I'm staying a couple of steps ahead of everyone in my school, trying to get them interested. But what I would love from you guys is if you guys can all just tell me one program that you thought was really helpful, like maybe App Inventor or maybe Scratch, or just so I can um, start to research them to bring them to my students. Um, well, I started a Girls Who Code club at my school, and um, the girls who started it with me, we kind of took the initiative to start teaching them because we didn't get our mentors yet. So we were using Code Academy, Dash, Scratch. Um, that's what we've used so far. So, Quick question, are your students... Uh, is this like a high school, middle school? Oh, it's middle school. Um, but I wouldn't, I would say whatever is good for middle school or high school or even elementary school. I have students of all, all different levels in the class. Some students know how to code and some are just learning. Okay. So. Personally, like I uh, also started a Girls Who Code club at my school and we also, before we got our mentors, we started with the very, very basics. Scratch is yeah. an extremely useful resource because it's it's really cute, it's really fun, um, and it's it really helps with the um, uh, with the I guess the, the building blocks that you would need in order to start learning um, legitimate languages. Uh, but after that, like even now, we're still using Khan Academy for JavaScript because it has uh, a lot of the documentation there for you, and it also gives you the chance to kind of start with a blank screen and then go from there. So you can have either or. So Khan Academy, and also I use Code Academy on my own. Code Academy is also a really good resource. I think. If you'd like, we can talk offline about 
starting a girls' food club. And the and oh, the master of middle school computing is sitting right behind you. Oh, I've, I've already picked your brain. Hey. I have I've already picked your brain. Oh, yes, you have a, no, I have a question for these more recent middle school people than I was. Um, so I teach middle school, and I noticed this year I'm teaching two electives. They're both in processing, and I have a sixth, seventh class and an eighth grade class. And in the sixth, seventh class, I've got about 30 kids, and there's half and half girl boy. And they're all into it, they're all whatever. Eighth grade, I have about 25 kids, one girl. What? So, what it, and I, eighth grade is really different. I don't know how many of you are, were in the public school system. The public school system is very different from the private school system here. And it's a, there's a lot of, um, there's just a lot going on, but what can I do, what, what is it, what's it about middle school, what's, you guys were there more recent than I was, and what is it about just this kind of stuff that kid, that girls might, like, what can I do, what can I do? I actually have a suggestion, mm -hmm. um, I think, because girls in that age group, they have older, like, they may have older sisters that they look up to and do that, so I think a really good idea would to be to bring, like, like teenage girls who do code into your classrooms mm -hmm. because like I remember being in middle school like I feel like like she's so cool. Because <laughs> <laughs> eighth graders are the cool ones. Yeah. So you so, gotta. Yeah. So no, that's unfortunately they'll be looking up to like the eighth graders, and if there's only one girl in that class, they're right. not like really yeah. discouraged from going into that class at all. Any other suggestions? I, I had a, I guess, like a similar suggestion. Maybe not necessarily just like you know, teenagers from high school, but actual eighth grade girls that are either in the class now or, uh, or like maybe girls that were in that class before and have moved on to high school. But someone who's been through that particular class, maybe if they come in and say, you know, hey, I was in your, I was in your shoes you know, X amount of years ago, and I also saw you know, like half a girl in that class, like. <laughs> And then, you know, it was it was weird, but um, I guess really sitting down and talking to uh, the really impressionable girls, it would be really helpful if someone in their age category or relatively close to them were to were to talk to them. Because I'm sure you guys have heard this a million times, but you know, it's not necessarily the same if your teacher says this is really cool, yeah. or if like your best friend says this is really cool. Yeah, and, and there's like. There's all these seventh grade girls, there's all these sixth grade girls, and then it just drops off. And I think what would sell me as an eighth grade girl is if maybe you didn't sell it so much as like computer science. And I don't, but yes. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I appreciate that because I, yeah. I think, do I? You know, even if I'm not trying to. So yeah. I think maybe incorporating more like an art almost. Uh -huh. like, you know, mm -hmm. Imagine, because like, I actually saw this really cool um, this app where you're able to draw dresses and then like mm -hmm. using code to make those. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think girls are very artsy. Mm -hmm. So you can have them, I don't know, use more of their creative mm -hmm. skills in the program. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sir, in the back, you had your hand up a while back. You want to... Well, I was going to ask a question of. Since the idea is to treat this like liberal arts, how much are you being exposed to the role that women have had in computer science, like Grace Hopper or Anita Bohr? Has anyone told you about those great women from computer science yet? Um, it goes in code, we have, that's it. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, I'm in a, a electronics class in my school, but that's more like, I guess, computer engineering than it is computer science. but. Famous names come up all the time, but mostly all the time they're male and white. But uh, never have I heard. Have you read about them at all? Oh yeah, absolutely. I've read, like read their biographies and stuff, or like little snippets of their work. But I get formally in school, I've never heard their names brought up. Well, maybe that's. I'm sorry, I'm Ashlyn's mom, but you know maybe that's an issue. Maybe it should be more. You know, you should, in your curriculum for the teachers, make sure that you tell them that, you know, these women, as opposed to just bringing up all of the, the males who are in, you know, in history, you know, bring up that there are women and make that more, you know, a focus as opposed to all the males. And we have on our website, not 
historical women per se, but um, we have 90 podcast interviews with female founders and inventors that have both a, a profile of that woman and what she invented and what she's known for, as well as a podcast, like a radio style interview of her inter being interviewed about her work. And it's either female founders of companies or it's female inventors of technology. And um, so that's a resource, and I can send Eric the link so he can share it out with you that um, you can just access and send your kids to that. There's a lot of them on there. There's also some men on there. We call them, it's our Entrepreneurial Heroes series. So um, there's also men on there as well. And I really recommend the David Letterman YouTube clip of Grace, Grace Hopper. Hopper. It's hilarious. And David Letterman looks young. And, um, <laughs> but she is really brilliant on that. Um, it's like a 20 minute little film. Okay, um, so you all are amazing, and thanks so much. Everything you're sharing is so helpful to us. Um, and the question I had was, what, what would you, you shared a little bit about some projects you did that you liked. What, what was one project that you did that when it was introduced, you thought, oh, this sounds really fun, and then when you did it, you're like, oh, I want to do more of this? Um, I interned at uh, Guilt last summer, and um, they said that um, just like the whole idea of like having computer science and fashion put together, like I didn't think that it would be that great because I'm like, this is just a way for them to like make me like, like fashion, <laughs> duh. And then like the more that I did it, and like the like the project that they gave me, like the more that I wanted to do it, and I'm continue like I continued it after the internship. It's like for me, uh, I'm not really like an artsy kind of person. Like I, you know, I don't really delve into like fashion or like, art or anything like that. Uh, but like what I really like is kind of the idea of really practical things. Uh, that's why I really liked the uh, the app that I worked on, the like, like find the bathroom. I was really proud of that. But um, like those kinds of things, that's that's what draws me. And ever since I did that project, that's kind of been my mindset, I guess. I'm trying to uh, kind of look around me and observe you know, what what can people not do yet, and then how can I make them able to do that on their iPhone. So Malika and I are working on an app. Um, it's called Uni Plus Plus, and it kind of matches you up with a college based on personality traits rather than your um, academic um, interests and so I think one of the great things about coding is that we can apply it to our everyday problems as juniors and seniors we found that our problem was it was kind of hard to find colleges that um, we thought were kind of perfect matches rather than what grades we have so I think um, using what we knew to kind of solve everyday problems in our lives was really fun and rewarding and um, yeah, and what caused us to stick with these projects was that we found a cause that we re we were really interested in and we kind of just stuck with it throughout. So instead of like dropping the project halfway through because it was something that we didn't like, that we were just forced to do because like it would impact our grades or something, it's something that we were willing to do, willing to create because we knew that it was a problem that we wanted to address. So actually, when I interned at Morgan Stanley this summer, my manager, he wanted me to build a, a site about project management. So what I really liked about that is that I know that programming is very like open, but and companies are going to be asked to do certain projects. So I liked, I would say, the realism of like a real project that you would use programming for in a company, something much more like this is like the real deal kind of thing. Um, can I just share, there's a resource that you guys could use for this called Intel Design and Discovery. It's a middle school, beginning middle to early high school <coughs> curriculum for girls in engineering. But the first two days of it are about the design process and understanding that the world around you is designed and that everything you use is touched by an engineer. And then you engage the girls in an iterative process of identifying a bug list of things that bug them. And then from that bug list, you derive your own project. And then they spend the next two weeks learning about engineering until they can develop a prototype. 
it could certainly be transferred to computer science problems, but the value of having a student identify a problem that is relevant to them is so much more. Almost every engineering outreach piece out there is drop this egg off the roof or build this bridge out of popsicle sticks. And the bottom line is those things are actually gendered in many cases and the girls don't care about them. And if they don't care, they don't finish it and they don't get invested in it. So a really good example was I had a student who built this entire system to sort and shake and dispense her nail polish based on light sensors and colors with conveyors and the whole thing. Is this a useful product that's gonna be on the shelf tomorrow? No, nobody needs a machine that's gonna do that. But the <laughs> fact that she invested the time to learn enough about sensors and conveyors and motors to be able to build that thing at age 13 is really valuable. And she spent six months on it with an electrical engineer and put it in the science fair and everything. And is it you know, gonna solve world hunger? No, but it was something that she was interested in. So I think it's just intel.com slash education slash design and that curriculum, the first two modules are really all about the design process and understanding that you can be an inventor and a problem solver and then getting your own, finding your own problem to solve. And it's a lot more work for you as an instructor to have 20 different problems that you're grading, but it's worth it. And I think there's a graceful way to do that. So I think the butchering of that is to be like, uh, we actually had a teacher at Girls Who Code did not do so well because he did this exact thing. Uh, build a website. And that's the first thing that they ever heard. And like, that's too open ended. We need to like, like the, the solution is not to go the other way and give them no guidance whatsoever. But like, for example, these girls are all talking about their mobile apps and they're speaking so well about it and I'm very proud. Um, but like the first thing that we did was we built a to-do list app, which sounds like somewhat boring, but the cool thing about it was that they got to design what it looked like. They could add a theme, they could do specific kind of things like adding a deadline, things like that. So they got to, got to design one that like, sort of intro them into thinking critically about those problems and then you, you follow up with the open-ended problem. So you don't want to swing too far the other direction. When half of the work is defining the problem. Yeah. I mean, most of engineering is actually defining the problem and a lot of people try to jump to the solution too quickly. So I think it's important to really iterate over and over on your problem and do the research as to whether or not you need an app to help find bathrooms, which in New York, everyone needs an app to help find bathrooms. <laughs> I need an app to help avoid tourists. <laughs> they actually, they, they thought of that though. Like they've, they, those girls are, they're still working on it. And like, they've already been like, yeah, we're, we're talking to the, you know, whatever the board, I don't know who does the tourism stuff. They're like, we reached out to them with a blue, blue. And I'm like, well, that's impressive. They're better than I am at this stuff. You need like a sister app, one that the tourists use, and then the other app that just tracks all the ones using the tourists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that, let's just say, I'm sorry, just one more question. I know there are so many, but I want to make sure everybody has uh, time to mingle and everything. Yes. And Raquel, Raquel, go ahead. Um, in your time of learning to code, have you ever wanted to just give up? And if you have, what did you tell yourself to continue? Um, yeah, um, my school has a major system, so at the end of your sophomore year, you have to choose a major, and I chose software engineering. So towards the end of junior year, I kind of wanted to drop it, but my guidance counselor convinced me otherwise because I applied to Girls Who Code and I got in, so I was like, why not stick with it? I have nothing to lose, and I did, and I don't regret anything. For me, after I left uh, the summer program for Girls Who Code, I was looking for uh, weekend classes, and I happened upon the one that Mr. Zanatsky hosts with, along with other Stuyvesant High School teachers. And I came in and I was like, oh, you know, I got this. Like, I had eight weeks of programming experience. And I came in and everyone else was like, oh, yeah, I like, had 17 years of programming experience. And I was like, oh. <laughs> um, so I kind of came in thinking, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing. I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not keeping up with any of the assignments. I, like, in class, I'm sitting there and I'm like, what is going on? And I'm kind of afraid to ask questions because I don't want to look stupid. But, um, I guess I just kind of remembered a lot of what like people like Ashley and my, my girls and code teacher said. Uh, a lot of a lot of the time <coughs> girls and code was devoted to 
kind of to telling us that you know, it's okay to to ask a question that everyone else knows the answer to because you know it's not the end of the world if you don't know something. And uh, a lot of the time is devoted to saying, you know, it's okay to not get something the first time or the second time or even the thousandth time because there's always a thousandth the first time that you can try it. So just kind of remembering and repeating over and over and over again those messages in my head was really what helped me to, to get through the, the frustrating part of, of CS. So, um, like, I think this is such a good question because since I was a kid, like, younger, my dad, he, he would always tell me, like, no, never just quit, like, that's just too easy. So, whenever I would be writing these, like, long programs or had a project, I always kept that voice in the back of my head, like, you know, just quitting, like, you just want to give up that easily. And that kind of motivated me to keep trying, you know, even even if I'm not like the best programmer. Like, just the fact that I overcame that problem, that feels really good. I really like that, so. I'm, uh, sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> Did you ever want to oh, quit? Don't and give up? I actually, I took, um, uh, APCS in high school, and I, my teacher wasn't like the best teacher, and that's what made me want to give up. So I think like having somebody who really cares about you and like telling you not to give up, like, like I said this to Ashley before, like teacher-student relationship, like the level of excitement, like even if the teacher's at 100, you're, like the highest potential that your student will be is like 90. So you have to be like 150 percent in order for your, your like your student to be at, like 100 or like 80. So like I think just like caring and showing that like that care yeah, yeah that's cool um, uh, during the growth of code program um like for every project that i had i always felt like i wanted to give up because the code like didn't work the first time like i wanted it to work but i was told uh, that frustration is your best friend so every time i wanted to give up i knew that frustration was the best friend so. <laughs> <laughs> why, is it, why is it your best friend <laughs> You're not going to always have it work the first time, so just keep on trying. It'll work. Oh. <laughs> let's just take one more. Let's take one more question, and then we're gonna we'll let you guys pick their brains, and you guys can mingle with uh, Ruth Lev, and from Lev. Lev? Uh, this this real quick the comment before about uh, co relating coding to assembling lots and lots of little pieces. Uh, were any of you enthusiastic about Lego when you were a lot younger? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> a quick follow up to that is the um, do, you, do you know about the Boldy blocks? Do you like that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember the the first time. I think I was just like on Facebook one night or something, and I saw a commercial for that. And I played the advertisement, and literally, as it, as it ended, I was sitting back and I was like, this is girls who code in seven minutes. Okay. Like, <laughs> that is literally everything that, you know, maybe like, you know, that has been said to me over the course of eight weeks, and then plus some afterwards. You know, I don't particularly remember when that came out, but it was all of that summed up into one toy, or you know, like one play thing. For, for younger girls, and that made me so excited that something like that came out. Uh, like right away I shared it, right away I was like, hey everyone, look at this, this is awesome, get this for your younger siblings and your cousins and your friends and your parents and whoever. This is really awesome, everyone should should play with this, Girl or bo girls or boys, everyone. And it just, it got me really, really excited that something like that finally came out. So when I was younger, I was really, I really, really wanted to be a spy kid. So I would spend like so many hours trying to build stuff and it's funny you mentioned Legos because I would like to build like uh, those, those silly electronics that would make in the movies. So I think just from a young age, like I like to put things together. So that was like a pretty good analogy. Oh, great everybody. While I do have you guys captive for just one more second, uh, our next meetup will be March 27th. The focus is computing across the disciplines. So I hope you guys see you all again. And Cindy, anything else? Yeah.
Yeah, so one more announcement, guys. Um, so we're going to start our very first inaugural New York City Scratch Educators Meetup. So um, Karen Brennan, who um, is one of the people that worked on Scratch um, when it first started, which resonate, um, she's going to come down. Come down. Come down from Boston to here. From Boston um, to help us head up the first one, and we're going to discuss not only what among the teachers, but how to get into the schools as well. Um, and this is a bit of an aside. I'm a little bit embarrassed because we don't have anything yet. But we finally got our Twitter handle, which is at CSNYC. I'm still trying to get a handle on it because I don't really know how to use Twitter. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, follow us. It will be populated very shortly, um, and then um, you can get an announcements um, from us. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. Um, it's going to be March 15th. Um, the location is going to be at our new office space um, called the Center for Social Innovation. Um, it's West 26th Street. Um, it will be on the meetup. It will be an event so you can get information via that venue and it will also be tweeted. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So, the date March, one more time. March three one five. March fifteenth, and we will we will we'll send you all that information through the meetup. And again, please make sure that table is empty.